Thanks to CuriosityStream for supporting PBS Digital Studios. Hey there, my name is Mike Rignetta. This is Crash Course Theater. And last time, we looked at how the liturgical drama, specifically a call and response section, smuggled into the Easter liturgy, helped bring theater back to the West. Today, we'll look at another way theater got snuck back into the Christian world. Who did the sneaking? A canoness. What is a canoness? It's a fancy kind of nun. Not often known for their sneaking, right? All those surprising sneaks took place in an abbey in an otherwise unremarkable spot in Lower Saxony, Germany. You can still visit it today if you want. Enjoy the half-timbered houses, and if you're old enough, raise a beer stein to Roswitha, the loud cry of Gondersheim, the queen of medieval closet drama and the world's first female playwright. Well, the first we know about anyway. I've heard there's lots of sneaking. <laughs> Prosvita was born in Saxony around the 10th century. We don't know how she came to take the veil, because record-keeping wasn't really medieval Saxony's jam. We do know Prosvita's name literally means strong honor, but she decided it meant something more like the clarion call or the loud cry, which I mean, hey, all of these very strong contenders, if you ask me. At some point, she joined the convent at Gondersheim as a canoness, giving her the freedom to own property, keep servants, and wear whatever kind of wimple she wanted. Yeah, it's good to be the canoness. She studied under two women at the convent, including the abbess, and became exceptionally well-read. Moreover, she read diversely, the Bible, sure, and the writings of the Church Fathers and the non-canonical Gospels, but also contemporary histories and secular Latin greats, too, like Ovid and Virgil. She even read our old friends Plautus and Terence, but those comedies were a little troubling for Rosvita. So much lewd behavior. So she decided to write her own versions. We're going to talk about those in two shakes of a Saxon sheep's tale. In addition to plays, she also wrote verse legends and histories, one about Otto I, the Holy Roman Emperor, and another about her own convent, all of them in careful meter. She's the first playwright of the Middle Ages, and if later woodcuts are anything to go by, her taste in wimples was, in fact, divine. Rosvita's plays are known as the Commedia Sacrae, or sacred comedies. Rosvita loved comedy. I mean, she loved God, too, of course, but she also loved Terence, who you may remember was a more polite writer than his contemporary Plautus. Fewer dirty jokes, less adultery, but still based on secular subjects, and that made Rosvita worry that her love for them was somehow harmful to her faith and the faith of others. She wrote in a preface that she knew a lot of Catholics were attracted by the polished elegance of the style of pagan writers, so attracted that they might prefer Terence to holy scripture. This is maybe selling short how much weird violence and sex stuff persists in holy scripture, but okay, that's weird violence and sex stuff that's in a holy text, so point taken, I guess. Rosvita warned that readers who were charmed by polished pagan elegance risked being corrupted by the wickedness of the matter. So she thought, hey, maybe I'll use my loud cry to write plays in the meter and style of Terence. Maybe they can be funny, but also holy. We believe in you, Rosvita. Care to guess what theme might interest a nun who has made herself a bride of Christ? That's right, chastity. If Terence is going to write about the shameless acts of licentious women, Rosvita is going to write about virgins, and also unchaste ladies who repent and embrace chastity. Basically, it's just a little bit of medieval slut-shaming. It's clear that love and sex fascinate Rosvita. In her preface, she blushes to admit her work has forced her to think about the dreadful frenzy of those possessed by unlawful love and the insidious sweetness of passion things which should not even be named among us. Sister, please! But she argues that only by coming to grips with lust can she demonstrate how much more wonderful the divine sucker is of those who resist it. Whether or not Rosvita's works were performed has been the subject of debate. Most scholars believe that Rosvita wrote her plays to be read, a genre we call closet dramas. After all, that's how she encountered Terence's plays, in book form, not on stage. It's probable that her work was read aloud, and remotely possible that it was performed privately in the medieval period. But since the late 19th century, her plays have been performed 
pretty often. At one point, the art collective The Gorilla Girls, who are rad as heck, and if you don't know them, Sarah did an awesome art assignment video on them, they offered a prize to any theater who would switch out a Greek tragedy written by a man for one of Rosvita's comedies. One of those comedies is called Dulcitius. Critics regard this as her funniest play, even though it describes the martyrdom of three young women. And yet, kind of a knee slapper. Dulcitius is based on and named after an historical figure, the Roman governor of Macedonia in the late third and early fourth century, known for persecuting Christian women. And the young women in the play are actual Christian martyrs, though IRL, they died a century before Dulcitius came to power. So Rosvita has taken some liberties. Take us there, Thought Bubble. Emperor Diocletian wants to arrange marriages for three virgin sisters. Agape, whose name means love, Irene, whose name means peace, and Kyania, whose name means snow, which basically means purity. Diocletian tells the sisters they have to renounce Christianity. They don't wanna. So he locks them up and he sends Dulcitius to question them. Dulcitius sees them through a window, decides they're all super hot, and asks them to be locked up in the kitchen so that he can um, visit them. Why he needed to assault them in a kitchen specifically, unclear. The sisters understandably don't want to be perved on by Dulcitius, so they pray, and their prayers work. When Dulcitius enters the kitchen, he thinks that the pots and the pans are the sisters, so he starts hugging and kissing them, which covers him in soot. When he leaves, the soldiers see his blackened face and think he's a demon, and so do the people at the palace. And I mean, in a sense, they're not wrong. He gets the snot beat out of him. Dulcitius fuming, he orders the sisters be stripped, but their clothes stick to them. Diocletian sends the torturer Sicinius, who orders Agape and Caenia to be burned at the stake. They die, though miraculously their clothes and bodies are left intact. Sicinius then orders Irene, the youngest, to convert. She won't, so he tells the soldiers to take her to a brothel. Instead, she's miraculously spirited away to a mountaintop. Sicinius orders the soldiers to shoot her with arrows, and she dies. But she dies secure in her chastity and her faith. Thank you, Thought Bubble. So, see what I mean? It is a laugh riot. Okay, so it's no what about Bob, but for a medieval Christian, this is at least a happy ending. The three sisters all end up dead, but the souls of Agape and Kyania are in heaven. And as Irene is dying, she says, I shall receive the martyr's palm and the crown of virginity. Thus, I will enter the heavenly bridal chamber of the eternal king, whose is all honor and glory in all eternity. Listen, that's at least half as funny as like a third of all SNL sketches. Anyway, you could argue that the crown of virginity isn't worth dying over, but because the sisters haven't been forced to compromise their bodies or their beliefs, they will receive eternal life. For Josvita and her audience, that is sweeter than anything. And it's definitely sweeter than being raped by a soot-smudged Roman dolt. It's worth noting that this emphasis on chastity suggests it was one of a very few ways that women could wield power in the Middle Ages. But this is likely more of a concern for present day readers than for Rosvita herself. And before we end today, we're gonna look at one other medieval female playwright, Hildegard of Bingen. Hildegard was born about a century and a half after Rosvita, and also had a killer nickname the Sibyl of the Rhine. She was more than just a writer, she was also a composer, a philosopher, a mystic, and a scientist who took time off to found and run a couple monasteries. She also made up her own language. Basically, Hildegard was a boss. One of her plays is the catchily titled Ordo Virtutum, which is Latin for the Order of Virtues. It's the only liturgical drama that survives alongside its music, which Hildegard also composed. It is lovely. The Order of Virtues is the first surviving example of the medieval morality play, a genre we're gonna look at more in depth in the next episode. It's an allegorical drama in which anima, the human soul, has to choose between the virtues and the devil. Guess which side Hildegard is on? Yeah, it's kind of a no-brainer for Anima too. But the virtues tell her that she has to go live in a body first. Once she does, the devil shows her how much fun worldly stuff is. 
Only later, old and thoroughly repentant about all that worldly pleasure, is she allowed to return to the virtues, who, by the way, are hope, chastity, innocence, contempt of the world, celestial love, modesty, mercy, victory, discretion, patience, knowledge of God, charity, fear of God, obedience, faith, and discipline, though her name is scratched out in the manuscript. But yeah, either way, big cast. Very tidy green room, though. Super low-key rap party. As we saw in the last episode, the usual explanation for theater re-emerging in the West is through the appearance of liturgical drama. But in the same century, a loud cry is heard across Lower Saxony. And a century and a half later, Hildegard answers the call. Prosvita and Hildegard of Bingen's works have a firmly Christian worldview and intention. They create female characters with the power and patience and faith to make brave, chaste choices. So, a round of applause for them. Next time, we take a look at the cycle plays, which is what liturgical drama turns into over a couple centuries. But until then, Curtain. Thank you to Curiosity Stream for supporting PBS Digital Studios. Curiosity Stream is a subscription streaming service that offers documentaries and non-fiction titles from some of the world's best filmmakers, including exclusive originals like Dream the Future, a 19-part series that enlists leading visionaries to predict what life will be like in 2050, narrated by Sigourney Weaver. The first 10 episodes are streaming now. Get unlimited access today, and for our audience, the first 60 days are free if you sign up at curiositystream.com slash crash course and use the promo code crash course during the sign up process. Crash Course Theater is filmed in the Chad and Stacey Emigold's studio in Indianapolis, Indiana, and is produced with the help of all of these very nice people. Our animation team is Thought Cafe. Crash Course exists thanks to the generous support of our patrons at Patreon. Patreon is a voluntary subscription service where you can support the content you love through a monthly donation and help keep Crash Course free for everyone forever. Thanks for watching. <laughs>